flexor file with which they give the balanced force technique. The balanced force techniques has some important points like it is used on pure rotary motion. All of you must be remembering that the filing motion is generally a linear motion which can be a push and pull or a rest wing motion or sometimes a watch winding motion but here there is an exception in the balanced force technique that we use only rotary motion. No pulling or resting of the file is done with this. Pure rotary motion is given. Okay. Secondly, secondly it has got a pical force. We apply a pical force during counterclockwise turn. Whenever we turn the file in counterclockwise motion, we give in a pical force. And this technique of tooth preparation for cleaning and shaping is based on crown down approach. Principally, there are two approaches, two fundamental approaches in cleaning and shaping of the root canal. Either we can go from the apex and move coronally, or we can start from the crown portion to the middle one third to the pical one third. So this crown down approach can be schematically represented as preparation of the root canal in phases first, second and third. We start from the coronal area and go to the pical area. This is crown down approach. So balanced force technique was given by Rowan et al. He invented a special symmetrical file called flexor file. Originally this technique was proposed with that technique, that file. A pical force is applied during counterclockwise turn and it is based upon crown down approach. Okay, so if we see the cross section of the root canals as seen from above and imaginarily divide them into four quadrants, then the largest file to bind in the coronal one third is inserted into the root canal because we are starting with a crown down approach the biggest file to bind in the coronal one third of the root canal is used so we if this is the root canal we take the largest file to bind in the coronal one third and when we see it from top we give a 90 degrees clockwise rotation so we rotate the file 90 degrees clockwise the file is like a screw because of the flutes present in it so when we rotate the file 90 degrees clockwise, it engages the coronal portion of the root canal. Now what we would do, we would turn the file 180 to 270 degrees counterclockwise. CCW stands for counterclockwise. So I would rotate the file counterclockwise. Now imagine the file to be like a screw when you Rotate the screw clockwise, it goes inside. Similar thing is happening with the file, it is going inside the root canal. Now we have to rotate it counterclockwise for 180 to 270 degrees. Whenever we rotate it counterclockwise, the file has a tendency to come out of the root canal. We have to prevent that. And how do we prevent that? By putting in a pical force or pressure on the file. So we would maintain a pical pressure and move the file counterclockwise 270 degrees so in this way we are not allowing the file to come out of the root canal it would machine the wall of the root canal it would enlarge the wall of the root canal and it would go deeper down then we again give a 90 degrees clockwise turn it goes further down in the second motion and then again counterclockwise like this we keep on doing it so it is based on purely rotary motions okay and finally when we reach the a pical portion of the working length we withdraw the file with long clockwise turn we withdraw the file with a long clockwise turn we have reached the bottom of the root canal the pical one third of the root canal now how I would remove the file I would never pull out the file the basic fundamental concept is only rotary motion so we would keep on rotating the file clockwise and pull it out from the root canal when we rotate it clockwise, whatever dentine has been cut, whatever root canal wall has been cut, the debris that is generated is loaded into the flutes of the 
file and taken off the, the root canal. If we rotate it counterclockwise and pull it out, whatever debris has been generated would be left and it would block the root canal. So always remember that whenever file is withdrawn, it is withdrawn with a long clockwise turn. These are the fundamental concepts of balanced force technique. Okay. Now we come over to the second question that came as displayed on your screens. The patient has deep carious lesion and had severe dull throbbing pain on chewing in first maxillary molar region. Which nerve fibers are stimulated in this situation? C fibers, A alpha, A delta, A beta fibers. It is again a simple question based upon the fundamentals of the structure and functions of the dental pulp. We know that it is asking about the sensory innervation of dental pulp. Now the sensory innervation of dental pulp consists of two types of fibers, A fibers and the C fibers. C fibers carry the dull throbbing pain and A fibers carry the sharp shooting pain. The question is asking about severe dull throbbing pain. So the answer to this question would be option 1 that is C fibers. Okay. If we quickly summarize the sensory innervation of dental pulp related to question number 2. The sensory innervation of dental pulp. If you guys would have attended the predictor series that was a YouTube session I took on 10th of March that is just one week before their NEET MDS examination. This was the thing that I discussed over there the sensory innervation and all in the revision for one or two hours that we did. So some of the questions the couple of questions were there from the predictor that is the last moment revision that we did on the YouTube session. Okay. So what I mean to say that we have been trying to mentor you very well at DAMS. The legacy always follows that the students are taken first. And whatever students join the DAMS, they have to keep the full faith in their respective teachers, subject teachers, and always treat your class notes for whatever subjects they are given as a religious text. Master them thoroughly and believe me that if you read those questions, read those notes properly, master them, you'll be able to crack not only NEAT but all your examinations with very good marks. Okay, so coming over to sensory innervation of dental pulp, we know that it consists of two types of fibers, the A fibers and the C fibers. The A fibers, they are myelinated. Okay, the C fibers they are non myelinated. A fibers constitute 20% of the sensory nerve fibers, the C fibers constitute 80% of the nerve fibers present in the pulp. So, majority of the fibers are C fibers. A fibers which are present in the pulp are of two types A beta fibers and A delta fibers. A beta fibers because they are sensory fibers, they carry the sensation of pressure. Pressure sensation is also called proprioception. Sensation of pressure or proprioception is carried by the A beta fibers. But they are very less in number. Only 10% of the A fibers are A beta fibers. Okay, so what you have to remember that the Pain of pulpal origin is difficult to localize. Sometimes this question has also come repeatedly that why the pain of pulpal origin, that is the pain of pulpitis is difficult for the patient to localize. The patient cannot point out to a particular tooth if there is pulpitis inflammation of the pulp. Why? Because the proprioceptors are very less in the pulp. Proprioceptors are what? A beta fibers. They are very less in number in the pulp. Only 10% of the 20% A fibers which are present in the pulp are A beta fibers. A delta fibers, they are the majority type of A fibers, 90% of the fibers. And what sensations do they carry? They carry the sensation of pain, temperature and touch. 
these three sensations are carried by the A delta fibers. These A delta fibers, they are present in the periphery of the pulp. Nearly at the pulp dentine border. What type of pain, the quality of pain carried by A delta fibers is short pain, shooting pain or sometimes called sharp pain. It is qualitatively different from the pain carried by the C fibers. And these A delta fibers, because they are present in the periphery of the pulp, they are mostly stimulated by dentinal tubular fluid movement. The mechanism responsible for the stimulation of A delta fibers is dentinal tubular fluid movement. Okay. Coming over to the C fibers, which are the majority type of sensory fibers. These C fibers, they are present in the center of the pulp. And the type of sensation that they carry is only pain. No other sensation is carried by the C fibers. Now they are the majority type of fibers in the dental pulp. And they carry the sensation of only pain. That's why they are called principal nociceptors. Principal nociceptors, the major type of fibers in the dental pulp which carry the sensation of pain are these C fibers and the quality of pain that is caused by C fibers is dull aching pain which is a throbbing pain. Whenever the pulpal damage is more severe it would be the C fibers that cause pain patient with symptomatic irreversible pulpitis, patient complaints of spontaneous pain, okay, is mostly because of C fibers. These C fibers are also called polymodal nociceptors. They are called polymodal nociceptors, means they are stimulated by not only temperature, greater than 110 degrees Fahrenheit but also acidic pH whenever the pH is less than 6 and they are also stimulated by certain chemicals like capsaicin. That's why they are also called polymodal. There are different modes for the stimulation of these C fibers and they carry a dull aching or throbbing pain which is less bearable than your C fiber sorry A fiber. Okay. These C fibers, they are slow conducting. Slow conducting, the pain conduction is slow with them with the rate of 0.5 to 2 meters per second. The conduction velocity is 0.5 to 2 meters per second. A delta fibers, they are fast conducting. Okay. They are fast conducting 5 to 30 meters per second conduction velocity. So at times they also ask you about the slow and the fast conduction velocities. So respectively these are the conduction velocities for these type of fibers. Okay. Coming over to the next question. This again was related to the pathophysiology of the dental pulp. That is tetrodotoxin receptors are present in. I think the recall language is slightly, I would say, disturbed with this question. It should be tetrodotoxin resistant receptors are present in what type of teeth. Okay. Options given are hot teeth, apical periodontitis, irreversible pulpitis or reversible pulpitis. It is again a straightforward and simple question. Tetrodotoxin receptors means tetrodotoxin resistant receptors are present in principally teeth with symptomatic irreversible pulpitis which are not being anesthetized with local anesthesia. Such teeth are called hot teeth. So please do not get confused with the options. It would not be irreversible pulpitis but the answer would be hot tooth. That is option number one. 
okay because tetrodotoxin receptors are present in such teeth okay we talk about the receptors we know that local anesthetics i am discussing the options related to question number 3 local anesthetics they act by blocking sodium channels of nerve fibers isn't it all of you know the mechanism of action of your local anesthetics now these sodium channels which are present on nerve fibers they are of nine subtypes designated as voltage gated sodium channels vgsc stands for voltage gated sodium channels and nav 1.1 1.2 1.3 so and up to 1.8 and 1.9 so the different sensory nerve fibers which are present in different parts of the body including the pulp they have got nine subtypes of voltage gated sodium channels which are blocked by your local anesthetics out of these nine subtypes the subtypes 1 through 7 they are sensitive to tetrodotoxin what is tetrodotoxin tetrodotoxin is a toxin which is obtained from a sea animal called puffer fish okay it is obtained from puffer fish this toxin when applied to these nerve fibers they blocks the conduction of these nerve fibers which nerve fibers sodium channels gated channel uh, fibers 1 through 7 but it is found that subtypes 8 and 9 they are resistant to action of tetrodotoxin they are resistant to the action of tetrodotoxin they are represented as ttxr sodium channels r stands for resistant ttx is the abbreviation for tetrodotoxin so these sodium channels 1 through 7 they are also sensitive to the action of local anesthetics okay and sodium channels 1.8 and 1.9 are not sensitive to the action of local anesthetics and whenever we find a tooth with symptomatic irreversible pulpitis means a patient is complaining of spontaneous pain in a tooth due to symptomatic irreversible pulpitis thus number of sodium channels subtypes 8 and 9 is markedly increased in such teeth so when such a patient sits for doing getting the root canal done and we attempt to anesthetize such a tooth it because the la is not effective such teeth are called hot teeth a tooth which is resistant or refractory to the action of local anesthetics is called hot tooth or hot teeth and what is the physiological reason due to excess number of sodium channel subtype 8 and 9 and what is the treatment for managing such hot teeth we have to do pre medication with non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs a pre medication with non steroidal anti inflammatory drug and the choice of drug in this sequence they are ibuprofen that is your brufen in a high dose of 600 to 800 milligram tds okay the second choice drug is ketorolac ketorolac trometamine or ketorol dt that is 10 milligrams tds 3 times a day and the third choice drug for managing such teeth is pre medication with paracetamol again in high doses of 1000 mg okay od dose 1000 mg od dose so these are the three non steroidal inflammatory drugs in decreasing order of potency recommended for managing teeth with symptomatic irreversible pulpitis which are difficult to directly anesthetize with local anesthetics what does these non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs do they abolish the prostaglandins 
which are released in inflammation and they make sodium channels sensitive. PGs stands for prostaglandins. This is the entire pathophysiology of events which takes place in cases of hot teeth. Okay. Coming over to the next question. Question number three. Sorry. Question number four. The color of number eight size file is again a very simple question based upon the instrumentation. Gray, violet, pink or purple. See 6, 8 and 10. They are the special endodontic files with the respective color coding of pink, gray and purple. 6, 8 and 10. Pink, gray and purple. It is asking about 8. So the answer would be option 1 that is gray. The size 8 number file has a color gray. Okay. Again a very simple question and all have been given to you in your class notes. For question number four, if we talk about then the files sizes are six, eight, and ten. These are the special files pink, gray, purple. Okay, then the file size is 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, and 40. They consist of six colors, white, six standard colors, white, yellow, red, blue, green, and black. So you have to remember the three special colors, pink, gray, and purple, and six routine colors, white, yellow, red, blue, green, and black and they keep on repeating in the same sequence the next size that is for 45 would again be white 50 would again be yellow like this the color coding repeats itself after 60 we have number 70 80 90 like this up to size 140 the entire range of instruments available hand instruments for cleaning and shaping of the root canals. Size 6 to size 140 and you have to remember three special colors pink, grey and purple and then white, yellow, red, blue, green and black repeat in the same sequence. Up till size 60 there is an increment of 5 each as can be seen and 60 onwards till 140 there is an increment of 10 each. There is no 5, 65, there is no size 75, 60, 70, 80 like this goes on. Okay, so this is about the color coding. All other things related to the standardization of hand instruments has been taken care of in your class notes. You can refer them. We come over to the next question. Question number five. Which radiographic technique is most effective for detecting early proximal caries? Proximal caries means on the mesial and the distal surfaces of the teeth. The options given are bite wing, occlusal radiograph, IOPA and OPG, orthopentomogram. Four different techniques are given. Most effective means the technique should be most sensitive and most specific for detection of caries. All of you must be knowing the answer to this it would be bite wing technique okay one of the most effective is bite wing okay so question number five if we talk about the bite wing a proper bite wing technique is sensitive in 40 to 65 percent cases the tendency or accuracy is 45 to 65 percent. No radiographic technique has a hundred percent accuracy in detecting your caries. The conventional techniques, the bite wing, then followed by IOPA. Occlusal is not used for the detection of caries, and OPG is least effective. 
the diagnostic sensitivity of OPG is least effective amongst all these techniques. Okay, amongst the conventional techniques, bite wing is definitely the most advantageous. If in the options they are giving you different modern techniques, not only all these, but techniques like CBCT, etc., then definitely they would be more effective as compared to bite wing. Okay, but amongst the conventional techniques, bite wing has a diagnostic accuracy of 40 to 65 percent, which is much above than those of IOPA or OPG. Remember that OPG is least effective in diagnosing caries. Coming over to the next question. Question number six. Now, which dental cement exhibits the highest solubility? Which dental cement exhibits the highest solubility? Usually, the question could have been more specific like solubility in water or solubility in the oral cavity on which comes in contact with different foodstuffs, etc., organic acids, etc. present. But it is directly asking you about the solubility in general. So, we would definitely have to answer it according to the solubility in water which is generally used for the comparison among cements. The options given are zinc polycarboxylate cement, glass ionoma cement, zinc phosphate and compomer. Now highest solubility, compomer is what? Compomer is basically a polyacid modified resin compos composite. Okay, When polyacid modified resin composite is present, they are having the least solubility. So out of the options given, resin cements and these compomers have the least solubility. The highest solubility would be amongst the options would be of glass ionoma cement. Answer to this question would be option 2 that is GIC or glass ionoma cement. Okay, For that you can remember again the sequence of solubility. Solubility in water which is generally used of cements from least to the most soluble resin cement is least soluble okay then we have zinc phosphate which is less than zinc polycarboxylate Then we have ZOE cements, then we have GIC, conventional GICs, non-modified GIC, okay, sequence. So most soluble in water it would be glass ionoma cement, okay. According to the options given, the answer would be glass ionoma cement. Coming over to the next question. Which of the following was the initial castable ceramic introduced? This question is related to the materials called dental ceramics. Castable ceramic, zirconia, dicor, magnesium, aluminium, spinel or ceristor. Again I would say those, all those who have read the class notes properly, okay, would have been able to answer this question straightforward. Castable glass ceramic is dicor. So the answer to this question would be option 2, that is Dicor, which is a castable glass ceramic. Option number 7, glass ceramics. There are a class of materials which are metal free systems, no metal is added, they are based upon glass. They were introduced by Macculloch in the year 1965. Macculloch. These glass ceramics, they are classified based on processing methods. They are classified based upon the processing methods as 
castable glass ceramics castable glass ceramics answer would be dicor an example of this is dicor then the second category were machinable glass ceramics machinable glass ceramics dicor mgc the suffix mgc is there okay both these ceramics the castable and machinable they are based on tetrasilicic floor mica crystals they are based on what tetrasilicic floor mica crystals sometimes they also ask you what type of crystals are present in these glass ceramics so they are both of them consist of tetrasilicic floor mica crystals dicor and dicor mgc then we have hot isostatically pressed glass ceramic hip stands for hot isostatically pressed sometimes simply called pressible glass ceramics pressable glass ceramics okay they are formed into shape by hot pressing method there are two generations of these materials hot isostatically pressed glass ceramics have two generations the first one they were based on lucite crystals these are tetragonal crystals lucite crystals okay they have low flexural strength they are weaker materials which are based on lucite crystals example of these first generation first generation are ips empress and opc okay then there are second generation of hot isostatically pressed glass ceramics which were improved in properties and they were based on lithium disilicate crystals i am again stressing that whatever has been given in your class notes is sufficient for your exams okay lithium disilicate crystals sometimes they also ask you which is a ceramic which is based upon lithium disilicate crystals example of these second generation glass ceramics which are based on lithium disilicate crystals are ips empress 2 only the suffix is different ips empress 2 and opc 3g you have to take care of these suffix simply ips empress and opc are first generation based on lucite crystals and second generation are based on lithium disilicate crystals and finally the fourth type of glass ceramics they are glass infiltrated core ceramics glass infiltrated core ceramics okay they are formed by slip casting method they are formed into shape by the slip casting method glass infiltrated core ceramics there are three examples of these ceramics in ceram spinal the spinal was one of the options given over there okay 
Inseram Alumina and Inseram Zirconia. Simply Zirconia was one of the options given over there. ICS, sorry, it is given as ICS, abbreviated ICA and abbreviated as ICZ. It consists of 100% sodium lanthanum glass. Sodium lanthanum glass. It consists of 70% of this sodium lanthanum glass plus 30% of alumina. And in serums, zirconia consists of 60% sodium lanthanum glass twenty percent alumina and twenty percent zirconia okay these are the three types of glass infiltrated core ceramics made by slip casting method so these are the four types of what your glass ceramics castable glass ceramics dicor machinable glass ceramic dicor mgc Hot isostatically pressed glass ceramics, two generations based on first generation leucite based, second generation lithium disilicate based and the fourth type of glass ceramics are glass infiltrated core ceramics formed by slip casting method. So they are castable, machinable, pressable and slip casted. These are the four types of glass ceramics. So the answer to this question would be Dicor option number two which is a machinable sorry castable glass ceramic coming over to the next question the sterilization of dental burrs is done by what again there is a problem with the language I would say is sterilization of dental burrs what agent is employed whenever we sterilize with autoclave or I would say moist heat method See dental burrs especially made up of carbide materials are prone to corrosion. So when we autoclave them, whatever tungsten carbide burrs etc. present, whenever we autoclave them repetitively they become corroded and rusted. So to prevent the rusting of burrs it is always advisable to add 2% sodium nitrite to the solution which is an anti-corrosive agent. Options are 2% sodium nitrite, 4% nitrate. 2% sodium nitrate and 4% potassium nitrate. Again, this has been taught specifically in your class notes that 2% sodium nitrite is added as an anti corrosive agent during sterilization of burrs, especially your tungsten carbide burrs. Okay, and this actually is very gratifying that whatever has been given to you in your class notes entire thing related to the subject has come over from there so our answer would be option one that is two percent sodium nitrite not nitrate but nitrite which is an anti-rust agent added to prevent the corrosion of carbide burrs okay there is nothing much to explain in this it is self-explanatory Coming over to the next question which is again very well taught in your classroom notes. What you see canal classification given in the images? It is an image based question. As you can see in the coronal portion of the tooth there are a single pulp chamber from which there you can clearly see there are two orifices, two separate canals originate which terminate as two separate apical foramen. So the configuration is 2 and it is according to what you see what? What you see type 1, 2, 4 or 5. For this again I would quickly tell you the what you see classification. Okay. What you see. Canal configuration. I have taught you two canal configurations one is veen and another is what you see 
and I've told you that majority of the questions repetitively they ask are either about the Wien's classification or from the what you see classification. Eight types are there according to what you see. Type 1 is designated as 1, simply written as 1 means 1 orifice, 1 apical foramen in the tooth like this. What you see type 2 is represented as 2 1 okay 2 they meet and they 1 2 1 what you see type 3 designated as 1 2 1 1 orifice 2 a single canal divides into 2 and then again joins and exit as 2 1 single apical foramen 1 2 1 configuration okay what you see type 4 is designated as 2 means there would be two orifice two canals terminating as like this this was given in the figure over there isn't it in your exam the figure was like this a single pulp chamber two canals means there are two orifice and two apical foramen so it was what you see type 4 Isn't it? What you see type 5? 1 2 configuration means in the root of a tooth there would be one orifice coronal, a single canal originates, bifurcates, and exit as two apical foramen. What you see type 6 represented as 2 1 2 means there would be two orifice, two different canals originate. In the middle one third of the root, they would join and then they would again separate, bifurcate, and exit as two apical foramen. Two, one, two configuration. What you see, type six, sorry, seven is represented as one, two, one, two configuration. Single orifice, a canal originates, divides into two, again join, and then again divide. One, two, one two configuration and what you see type 8 is represented as 3 means in the floor of the pulp chamber we find three orifice three separate canals originate and terminate as three separate apical foramen all these are possible realistic configurations which we can encounter in different groups of teeth okay and the tooth which has shown all the possible eight types of vertices configurations is maxillary second premolar. This tooth has depicted all the possible eight configurations. And as a quick summary, according to the Wien's classification, there are four types. At times they ask you questions about Wien's classification also. The so Wien's would be type 1 is same as vertices, that is 1-1 one, one configuration. Type 2 is 2-1 two configuration. Vein type 3 is 2 configuration. And Wien's type 4 is 1-2 configuration. So there is a slight difference between the veins and the vertices classification. You have to remember them. Vein is, this is represented as 1, this is 2, 1, this is 2, and this is 1, 2 configuration. Veins con classification. Okay. We move over to the next question, question number 10. Okay, An 8-year-old boy presents with a pink proliferative growth observed in the pulp chamber of a tooth. Okay, This growth was noticed during a routine dental examination and appears to be emanating from within the pulp cavity. 
based on the description which of the following diagnosis is most likely so there is a carious tooth in a young child which has got a pink growth okay we know that the pink growth in a carious tooth a cavity which is formed due to carious tooth can be either the gingiva grows most of the time it is the gingiva which grows inside the tooth okay into the cavity and at times because of a chronic low grade infection from a carious tooth the pulp shows a proliferative response it proliferates and forms a pulp polyp how do we differentiate between a gingival and a pulp polyp we have to gently probe the lesion and look at the stump stump means the origin or the stock of the lesion if it is from the gingiva it is a gingival polyp it is from pulp it is chronic hyperplastic pulpitis so very simple question and very simple options are given gingival polyp chronic hyperplastic pulpitis pulp hyperemia or internal resorption the question itself says that on examination the growth appears to be emanating from within the pulp cavity when we probe the lesion move it it is found to be originating from within the pulp cavity answer would be chronic hyperplastic pulpitis which is also called pulp polyp okay so answer to this question is option number 2 okay and the last question question number 11 related to my subject which has been recalled a pregnant woman experiences pain in the maxillary first molar okay which has an amod amalgam restoration amod all of you must be knowing mesio occlusal distal when chewing the woman is experiencing pain during chewing the pain subsides upon release of the bite it is important to note that it is not an spontaneous pain a tooth with an amod amalgam present and when the patient chews bites upon the food stuff there is pain when the pay, patient releases the pressure the pain is relieved the tooth shows normal pulp vitality and a response to cold testing diagnose the given condition whenever the pulp testing is done with cold normal response was there so what you have to remember that this is giving a history of pain in a patient the pregnant woman is given just for creating confusion it has got nothing to do with the pregnancy the patient's pain is relieved when the pressure is released what is the cause irreversible pulpitis no because pain of irreversible pulpitis is mostly spontaneous okay without any stimulus here the stimulus is chewing cracked tooth syndrome yes can be the possibility apical periodontitis no acute pulpitis no because acute pulpitis would again is synonym with irreversible pulpitis only there is mostly spontaneous pain in cases of apical periodontitis the pain is usually not relieved so soon so the answer to this question would be cracked tooth syndrome okay or we can say it is simply a cracked or split tooth again it has been taught very well in your class notes that whenever cracks are present there are four special test of the pulp one is a bite test okay this bite test is done to find or detect cracks in the tooth what are cracks cracks are incomplete fractures a bite test is done so it is done with device called tooth sleuth or freck finder there are devices like this okay there is a pad on seeing it from the lateral aspect it has a central cupped area this device is called freck finder or tooth sleuth these are the two views the occlusal view and the side view of the tooth sleuth this cupped area is placed against one of the tooth cusp and we ask the patient to bite down when the patient releases the pressure there is pain 
on release of pressure due to tubular fluid movement okay due to the crack there's microscopic movement of the tooth fragments which causes dentinal tubular fluid movement and whenever there would be dentinal tubular fluid movement the fibers present in the periphery of the pulp would be stimulated which fibers are present in the periphery of the pulp they are the a delta fibers so such cases are used to detect the presence of crack and the diagnostic sign is pain on release of pressure while biting there is no pain okay other tests which are helpful in detecting the cracks are trans illumination sometimes which is also called digital fiber optic trans illumination d4t technique is used okay if this is a tooth with a crack what is done a strong fiber optic light is shown from one part of the tooth the operatory is made dark okay there is fluid in the crack there is fluid present in the crack it blocks light transmission the fluid present in the crack blocks the light transmission this is the principle of what trans illumination or digital fiber optic trans illumination this has also been asked what is the principle why the light is blocked it is because of the fluid which is present definitely in the oral cavity saliva and other fluids are present so microscopic penetration is there inside the crack and this fluid which is present inside the crack blocks the propagation of light so the part of the tooth toward the light is bright in color and away from the light behind the crack is dark so we can find the crack in the tooth with trans illumination these are the two methods used for detecting cracks in the tooth sometimes we can stain the tooth 1% methylene blue So which dye is used for staining the tooth for detection of cracks? 1% methylene blue dye. So these are the different methods of detection of cracks in the tooth. Okay. So these were the 11 questions that I got from the recall from the recently concluded NEET MDS 2024 examination. And all were relatively simple and straightforward. So we have completed the recall for the NEET MDS 2024 examination and my best wishes to all of you for the forthcoming INICET exam. Be confident and do well. With this I am signing off. Thank you very much everyone for attending the session. हेलो सर गुड इवनिंग हाँ गुड इवनिंग मैं इंदर कंक्लूड हो गया है वो ओके सर है ना बंद करता हूँ सर मैं ठीक 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 ओके सर बस और कुछ थोड़ी करना है ठीक है ना